Welcome, welcome to this webinar on EHA 2023 Myeloma and AL amyloidosis highlights organized by Myeloma Patients Europe. I'm Solène Cladrel and I will be the moderator of this webinar. I will first uh, briefly introduce MPE and our speaker before, before giving him the floor. Um, and I will um, go over some uh, few housekeeping rules. So Myeloma Patients Europe or MPE is an umbrella organization of myeloma and amyloidosis patient groups across Europe. We have currently 49 members based in 31 countries and our mission is to provide education, information and support to our member groups and to advocates at European, national and local levels for the best possible um, research and equal access to treatment and care. Um, so today we're going to talk about EHA 2023. Um, so EHA is a non-governmental and non-for-profit membership organization that is guided by the mission to promote excellence in patient care research and education in hematology. It stands for European Hematology Association. Uh, and it connects hematologists worldwide. It's the largest Europe-based organization that brings together medical professionals, researchers, and scientists with an active interest in hematology. Uh, and it holds an annual Congress to facilitate that mission. And that's uh, what we will talk about today. Um, so this year's annual Congress has held was held at the beginning of June in Frankfurt, Germany, with more than 10,000 people attending. And we have organized this webinar to share with you the highlights of the conference, so you can ask questions related to the latest results uh, in the myeloma and amyloidosis uh, fields. So I'm very, very pleased um, to welcome our speaker of the day, Professor Mohamed Moti. He's the professor and head of the hematology and cellular therapy department, Saint Antoine Hospital and Sorbonne University in Paris, in France. And his department is one of the largest hematology departments in France and Europe. He has a strong expertise in clinical research and a deep knowledge in the field of stem cell transplantation, um, therapy of leukemia and multiple myeloma and uh, many others that I won't cite. Um, and over the last decade, he has played a key role in the approval of different hematology drugs. So thank you so much, Professor Morty, for being there today and for dedicating some of your precious time um, to Myeloma Patients Europe. So before we start, I would like to give a short reminder on um, how to use the Zoom webinar app to our audience. So um, the first one is that uh, as attendees, you will not be able to see or he um, hear uh, um, the other attendees in the webinar, you should be able to see and hear the presenters, uh, but not other attendees. Um, and if you can't hear the presenter, make sure that your speakers are not muted and that the volume is set high. You can watch the webinar in gallery view to um, enable you to see all of the presenters in a tight format on your screen. And the view screen can be changed on your upper right corner um, of your screen, and you can toggle back and forth between gallery view and speaker view. You can use the question and answer or Q&A feature, which is found on the toolbar at the bottom of the window. Uh, please use this feature to ask a question to the panel. Um, and you can click on the like button to upvote a question and let us know what questions are of high interest to you. And we will start with those ones. Um, so, um, don't wait until the end to ask your questions as we will try to group them by topic while the presentation is still ongoing uh, and don't hesitate to tell um, what is exactly the trial you would like more information on or the specific topic is um, you know a few minutes after we might not remember what was the question related to. Um, and um, you can use the chat feature to chat with other participants, share your experiences or comments on the current discussion. And if you are experiencing a technical issue, please let us know, let us know about it uh, here in the chat and one of my colleagues will assist you. Uh, do not use the chat to ask questions to the presenters, but use the Q&A feature for that purpose. Um, if you're having any trouble uh, with poor video or signal cutting in or out, consider attending in audio mode only and bypassing the video. Um, and if you don't see the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom window, move your mouse slightly and the bar will appear. 
the bar disappears after a few seconds um, when uh, it is on full screen mode. Um, so just to let you know, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website, www.mpeurope.org and social media channels um, after the end of the webinar. Uh, one last thing, the webinar is intended to provide information on um, and discuss clinical research and results that have been presented at EHA this year and not to provide personalized medical advice. Uh, so please consider this when sending us your questions. And now we are going to hear uh, Professor Moti's presentation. Thank you so much uh, for being here again and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Solan, for the kind introduction, but also the invitation that I really uh, appreciate. And uh, I'd like also uh, to emphasize and thank you and say how grateful we in, as healthcare professionals to what uh, Maloma Patient Europe, uh, uh, you as a team are doing uh, for the benefit of the patient and their families. Uh, this is a horrible disease, a chronic disease, and the support of uh, advocacy group like uh, uh, MPE is really uh, crucial. Uh, but of course, I can't start this webinar without uh, saying how uh, humbled and uh, grateful I am to the patient who really trust us and uh, uh, well, actually, they put their life in their lives in our hands as physicians and healthcare professionals, and uh, I'm always uh, very moved by uh, the trust. And you are the driving force, you as patient, behind all what we do and what we would like to achieve. So I've been asked by uh, the team to give you a summary about what happened at EHA uh, 2023. Uh, obviously, we can spend a full one, two, three days uh, to give the total summary. So I have to select, and on any selection, there is a bias because what I selected is what I personally view as the most attractive, but also the uh, studies and drugs that are already, I would say, available or will be available soon, because I thought it would be less interesting to speak about studies that will come to us in four or five years. We'll have ample time to discuss them. But of course, I'm more than happy to take the questions uh, if uh, you have any specific question about future studies. Uh, just for the sake of introduction and to uh, give a historical overview about the treatments of multiple myeloma. Uh, I don't know, of course, uh, uh, the history of the, each individual attendee, but until the mid nineties for multiple myeloma, we were almost exclusively using conventional chemotherapy. And that started in the early sixties, late fifties, and for 35 years, there were no single, there was no single drug approved. We had to wait until the late uh, 2000, early 2000s, late 90s here, where thalidomide was introduced. So the Emmet family. And then we had very quickly lenalidomide, but it took almost 10 years to get pumalidomide. So you can see the advances started like 30, 35 years, then 10, 15 years, and there is now an acceleration. We had also the first in class protosim inhibitor, bortezomib. And then we had to wait for another 10 years before having second generation protosim inhibitors like exazomib or carfizomib. Then we had the first monoclonal antibody by the mid 2015, 14. Uh, especially daratumumab and more recently isatuximab. Elatuzumab is, has been around for some time, although it's not uh, very widely used, although it's a very safe drug, but the efficacy is a little bit moderate. Uh, but then by the early 2020s, 
we had the full advent of immune therapy. Uh, and here you can see that the acceleration, uh, it's about like two or three years uh, for the advent of a new agent. So a huge acceleration, and this is uh, providing a lot of hope. And you will see that the keyword from uh, the EHA Congress, and I heard there is a debate that we may call it EHA, uh, personally call it EHA, it's easier for me. Uh, but also before EHA, we had the ASCO uh, Congress and we had the COMI Congress. And actually I can assure you, the focus is about immune therapy and how to manipulate the patient immune system. So it's like a dream where we always say, oh, how can I use my body uh, to fight my cancer? Well, immune therapy is typically uh, this story. And why do we need immune therapy, especially in the most advanced patient, but in the future, we will see it being used earlier because if the patient have received already lenalidomide, pomalidomide, bortezomib, carfizomib, daratumumab, isatuximab, you know, they become what we call pentarefractory. This is like you have received five drugs and the disease has become resistant. And here, the outcome is quite dismal. So you need the new options. And this is exactly the role of immune therapy, where you have two ways of manipulating the immune system of the patient. And when I say manipulating, it's in a positive manner to educate this immune system to fight the myeloma cells. So either you can do it, let's call it in vitro. So you take the T cells of the patient. These are your own body T cells. They are taken by apheresis. They are manipulated, engineered in the lab. There is a manufacturing time of, let's say, three, four, five weeks, six weeks. And this is about the CAR T cells, the chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And once they are manufactured, engineered in vitro, they are reinfused in the body and they are educated to go to find the plasma, the malignant plasma cell, the myeloma cell, and kill it. You have another immunotherapy technology, and this is uh, about actually uh, what I would call manipulating the immune system in vivo. So you don't take the cells out. Actually, you would send an antibody, we call it a bispecific antibody, that on one hand will go and capture the T cell through a marker called CD3. And on the other hand, it can also link to the tumor antigen on the malignant plasma cell, for instance, BCMA, which is the most popular one. And by catching the T cell through the CD3, it can bring it by hand, you know, to the myeloma cell. And then you have the killing cascade. And at EHA, at 2023, we heard a lot about these bispecific antibodies, which are really uh, quite amazing in terms of efficacy. We had the long-term follow-up of teclistamab, which is already approved and available in many European countries, either commercially or on a compassionate axis. And I will not go through all the details, but this is a relatively large number of patients, 165. You can see the characteristic of the patient. You can even give it to elderly patient, to patient from all ethnicities, uh, patient with extramedullary disease, patient with lots of risk factors, but also, as you can see, patient who received the median of five lines of therapy. Remember, I told you, pentarefractory. So when you have received all kinds of drugs and become refractory, actually, there is a confirmation here with a long-term follow-up that more than 60% of the patient will respond. 45% 
will be in complete remission, which is quite incredible, I would say, uh, for such a, a heavily advanced uh, population. And if you look to the overall outcome of the patient, whether the whole group or but the patient who are in CR, actually we're talking about more than two years of median progression-free survival. Uh, so really, and if you, took, if you take everybody, then we're talking about roughly a little bit less than a year, 11.3 months. So you can see, it's really a quite amazing to achieve in patient where they are supposed to have four, five, six months maximum, you're going up to 12 months. And if they got, they achieved CR, it's more than two years. And if you look to the overall survival, it's even uh, better, of course. And this is uh, quite amazing. What about the side effects? Well, we need to be aware, and this is important for the patient to know, that it is about the infectious complications. And because when these antibodies mobilize and stimulate the T cells of the body, all these T cells are going to fight the cancer cells. So uh, remember these same uh, T cells have a role on infections, infectious complication. They are our soldiers that protect us. So obviously they will become exhausted. And this is why you see a higher incidence of infections. And the message for the patient is more about to really uh, being very strict on prophylaxis and prevention measures, because there are some very important prophylactic drug that would allow to avoid uh, these uh, severe infections. We have another very exciting agent, another bispecific antibody called ranatamab, which is actually very similar to teclistamab. And both of them are really being developed very quickly. And I had the opportunity to update the results of this magnetism three trial. So you can see here uh, the schema of uh, how it works. It has like two bindings. Uh, on one hand, it captures the T cell and it brings it to the, the tumor cell. And then you have the killing cascade. And here we had the update of one cohort from the study, 123 patients. Again, we can give it to the elderly patient. The oldest one has, was 89 year old. So very important. And what you can see here is also uh, that these are heavily pretreated patient, uh, five lines of prior therapy. These are the initial results. And when we look to the updated results, we confirm, and the updated results were captured in a blinded fashion, which is a very powerful tool uh, uh, to uh, assess objectively the responses. So you can see that, again, similar to teclistamab, you have the same range of response, but also you have 35% more than complete remission. And if you look to the uh, duration of responses, well, these are really uh, very, very elegant responses. I don't think I need to spend a lot of time to highlight how these curves are very beautiful uh, being in a plateau. And it is quite amazing, for instance, to have uh, a PFS, progression-free survival at 15 months, almost 90% in those patients who achieve complete remission, 51% in the uh, overall population. So you can see teclistamab and ranatamab are already available at least on a compassionate early access uh, programs. And they are easily, I would say, can be administered in 
almost all hospitals, in my best guess, they will become more and more popular. And given these results, as you may guess, the idea is to combine them with other effective drugs, because here we are talking about single agent, to use them in earlier lines, yes, if, if it works very well in highly advanced patients, well, it should work perfectly in earlier stages of the disease. But also, if we can target using the bispecific technology, one tumor antigen like BCMA, maybe we can target other antigens, and then it gives more, I would say, options to kill the tumor cells. And this is exactly, for instance, about talketamab. So talketamab is another bispecific antibody. It's not yet approved or commercially available, but we have it in clinical trials, and I think it will become rapidly available. That is my hope. And it targets a different antigen called GPRC5D. So it's different from BCMA. So very excellent opportunity. And we have the update at EHA of this so-called monumental one uh, trial. I will not go through the details of the trial, but you can see that these are high number of patients, median age 67 up to 84 or even 86. Same story. These are patients who received the different uh, available drugs. They have received actually a median of five or six lines of therapy, but also they have received even some of the modern agent like Belantamab, and they have received the usual suspect. If you look to the response rate, well, again, we are talking about response rate more than 70%. So see, with these by specific, the responses are between 60 to 70%, which is very unusual. Usually, in a refractory multiple myeloma patient, you would expect like 30% of responses historically. Here we're doing at least double 60%. Uh, and the follow-up of uh, these studies is already quite decent, you know, for such a heavily pretreated population. And if you look to the uh, duration of responses and outcomes, Again, uh, these results are quite, I would say, uh, amazing uh, in such heavily pretreated population. But that was the beautiful part of the story. As usual, unfortunately, we have to be careful about the side effects. So we have the infections I mentioned with the other bispecific, but they are less frequent, probably because the target is different, GPRC5D. GPRC5D is less involved in the immune system compared to BCMA. But here, there is a sort of an off-target side effect, which is some skin toxicity, but also what we call dysgosia. When the patient, you know, for instance, you don't feel the taste of what you eat, which is, I must confess, uh, uh, quite... Uh, annoying. Uh, usually it doesn't stay forever, so things will improve, but you need to be aware of it because otherwise it can be a surprise that you don't feel any more the taste of salt or sugar or whatever. So it needs to be known. And as I said, as I mentioned, the infection, the incidence of infection is uh, lower, but they do exist. And my message here again, please follow the instructions of your doctor in terms of prophylaxis, in terms of taking uh, your prophylactic medication. But then of course, as I said, if every bispecific antibody alone works very well, why don't we put them together? And then it will be even better. And that is exactly what has been done in this so-called redirect TT1 study, where actually they combined teclistamab, the one I presented first, and telketamab. This is the one I have just presented. Again, I don't think 
we need to go into the details of the design of the study, but it is uh, very exciting because in the study, they have really included uh, some difficult and hard to treat patient, especially the patient with extramedullary disease, because you know very well that multiple myeloma is a disease of the bone marrow. But sometimes, especially in advanced patient, the disease will go out and you have what we call extramedullary localization in different organs. And when the disease is out of the bone marrow, it means it has become very aggressive. And they are, these patients are more difficult to treat. And this is why one third of them were included in this trial. And actually you will see the results were very attractive. Well, first question is, is it safe to combine two by specific? The answer is yes. Of course, we always see the usual side effects when it comes to the low blood counts, some anemia, some low platelets. We of course see the side effects of every bispecific. So you see the dysgosia I mentioned, uh, you can see the skin toxicity, the nail uh, disorders, but also the infections. Uh, but on the other hand, so yes, on the other hand, uh, you have a really incredible, almost, you know, 100% response rate, 96.3%. So by combining the forces of two highly effective agents, actually it can lead to very, very potent responses. And although the follow-up is still relatively short, actually the median uh, PFS uh, is already uh, around 21 months, especially given that one third of the population uh, was very hard to treat. And the median time to achieve the first response is rather quick in less than two months, uh, these patients uh, will respond. And if we put a focus actually on the patient uh, with extramedullary disease, and here it is really a very strong signal to say maybe these very difficult patient uh, may benefit from this combination, you can see they are responding extremely well. And during the presentation, the authors showed this example. I don't need, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time. You can just observe this skeleton, all the black uh, uh, spots are about uh, the myeloma localization. And you can see here on the right hand side, how things were really uh, clean and disappeared. So this is really a quite promising. Uh, and of course, hopefully at some point we will be able to use these combinations. So that was, I would say, what I consider as a summary of the most attractive and hottest uh, agent when it comes to bispecific antibodies. So these are the immune therapy in vivo, directly in the blood. You don't need to take anything out. But if you want to engineer the T cells and get the CAR T cells, well, we have heard during EHA in the plenary uh, session, a very important uh, study, the results of a very, very important study called CARTITUDE 4. And this study is actually as a study which randomized a CAR T cell construct called SILTA cell to a non-cellular therapy treatment, standard of care, namely pomalidomide bortezomib dexamethasone, PVD, or daratumumab pomalidomide dexamethasone. These are very common regimens because you may remember that CAR T cells today, they are exclusively used 
in those patients who are very, very advanced. Here's the idea is to give CAR T cells for early relapse. For instance, between the first and third relapse. So it means if CAR T cells work very well in very advanced patient, do they work also? Can they work better than what we give with the usual drugs? So you have patient to receive standard of care. So no CAR T cells, and then patient who received CAR T cells. So obviously when we say randomized, then half of the patient go in one group, half of the patient go in another group, but the two groups are very balanced because obviously if you want to compare uh, in a, uh, I would say, uh, fair manner, because this is the idea in clinical research where you have to compare in a fair way the, to, to, to find out whether treatment X, Y, Z is better than another treatment, they need to be balanced. And obviously here they are very balanced. And I would like to draw your attention that in contrast to autotransplant, for instance, CAR T cells can be given easily, well, easily, at least routinely, uh, up to age 80 and beyond. So CAR T cell eligibility is different from uh, autotransplant eligibility. But this is the most, I would say, beautiful result of the Congress and of uh, the uh, article of the study of the paper, where you can see that actually the CAR T cells, the SILTA cell is doing really much, much better than our conventional uh, drugs, even if they have included daratumumab. And the hazard ratio is 0.26. What does mean hazard ratio of 0.26? It's very simple. It means that you have one minus 26, this is uh, 100 minus 26, this is 74. It means you have 74% improvement with the CAR T cell, the blue curve, compared to the green curve. So the conclusion or the corollary of this that probably at some point, hopefully we will get the approval of CAR T cells to be even used in earlier lines of therapies. And why is it important? Because obviously CAR T cells are a single shot treatment. You give them and the patient is treatment free. So you can enjoy some treatment free interval. Of course, we need to be honest about it the patient will continue to relapse because otherwise there is cure, but still uh, the results are really uh, very uh, impressive. And why the survival results are impressive? Well, because the response rate, because really the SILTA cell CAR T cell is able uh, to destroy the myeloma uh, cells. And you can see uh, almost 85% of response. And these are really deep responses because if you look to MRD, and I'm sure many of you heard about MRD, so MRD is the technology by which we look really to the lowest amount of disease remaining in the body of the patient. And actually the CAR T cell are able to achieve, to, to lead to really very deep MRD negativity. And the safety is very good. Safety is very good because although this is cellular therapy, but usually the toxicities we see with CAR T cells when we treat lymphoma or leukemia, acute leukemia, are less uh, frequent and less severe in multiple myeloma. Of course, it requires hospitalization. So I'm not saying it's gonna be a holiday or a vacation to get CAR T cells, you still need probably three to four weeks of hospitalization. You usually use some form of chemotherapy before because you prepare the ground 
before infusing the CAR T cell, then you have you infuse the CAR T cells, your CAR T cells start proliferating. You know, it's like, you know, you're trying to grow a grass or whatever, and then it takes some time, but then the responses are uh, very quick. There is maybe a signal that we need to be aware of and the patient need to be aware of that some patient may develop some unusual neurological toxicities. And they are usually what we call maybe Parkinson-like uh, symptoms. They are reversible, so they disappear, but they can be quite worrying, I would say, and very unusual because if you are a young patient and suddenly you start having like Parkinson-like symptoms, uh, that can be uh, very uh, impressive to the patient and to the uh, family. So you need to be uh, aware of this, but definitely the uh, results of this CAR-T4 trial are a milestone for, I think, the approval of uh, CAR T cells uh, earlier in the line of the uh, myeloma uh, disease. And they are actually similar to another trial that was published four or five months ago called KARMA-3 trial, which has used a different CAR T cell product. And it has led to similar results showing that the CAR T cell is able to do better than the standard of care. So in summary, I would like to leave you with this slide, which in my opinion, summarize really the huge advances. And you can see these beautiful curves going up when it comes to survival. And I believe that today in 2023 and in the next few years, with the use of bispecific, but also CAR T cells. And of course, I deliberately focused on this, but there are other advances and we may discuss them if you wish uh, about small agents called uh, cell modes. There are some other form of immune therapies. There are of course the antibody drug conjugates. There are small molecules like melflufen, like selinexor available. So if you put all this together, the future, in my opinion, looks brilliant. And today, again, I keep on repeating this to my patient, the best ally for a patient is time. So you have to gain time. And if you, what the American colleagues say, if you buy time, then you can be ready for another line of treatment. But you can see even the most advanced patient, uh, we are able, to achieve some relatively long uh, remissions. So with this, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And of course, I'll be more than happy uh, to take questions that I can see there are already plenty of questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Moti, for this very comprehensive presentation and of the most relevant results. Um, presented at EHA this year. Um, yeah, let's move to the question and answer session. Maybe I'll start with one question regarding AL amyloidosis because we um, we also have AL amyloidosis patients in our community. And uh, I would like to know if there is anything to share about new or uh, improved AL amyloidosis treatment that you might've heard of at EHA this year. Yeah, so I, I didn't mention amyloidosis, but definitely uh, amyloidosis has been, I would say, dramatically in a positive way. Uh, the outcome has been dramatically improving. And we know that the backbone for the treatment of amyloidosis is actually uh, based on anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, namely daratumumab, plus uh, combinations like VCD, bortezomib, cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone. But the novelty is that for the near future, we will also see other antibodies, other more uh, targeted specific agents that are capable of uh, stopping and controlling the uh, amyloidosis uh, secretion. But a general message 
for the patient who are struggling with amyloidosis, it's relatively straightforward and easy to understand. All the drugs that work in myeloma actually work very well in amyloidosis. Of course, amyloidosis is an orphan disease, so you would rarely see specific trials for amyloidosis. And for many years, we've been using the drugs in amyloidosis off-label because they didn't get a label specific, but also now that daratumumab is approved. But definitely, all the advances we see in myeloma are relevant actually to amyloidosis. Okay, thank you. Now I will uh, move to the audience questions. Um, we have questions around bispecifics, around CAR T, questions that apply to both. So I will try to um, sort them out. Uh, maybe one uh, question regarding the expression of CD3. Um, and, you know, maybe we can. Um, uh, make this question a bit broader, speaking about uh, receptor expressions in, in general. So um, the question was, do all myeloma patients have uh, CD3 on their cells? Um, and uh, maybe we can expand that to BCMA or even GPD, GPDRC5D um, and other um, receptors and how um, this can impact um, treatment efficiency. Yeah, no, very good questions. So just to clarify, uh, on the tumor cell, on the plasma cell, you have antigens. Uh, and for instance, the most popular antigen is BCMA. The CD3 is an antigen and a marker of T cells. So it has nothing to do with the myeloma cell. And when you give a bispecific antibody, it has like uh, uh, two legs. On one hand, it goes and captures a T cell. And on the other hand, it, it goes to the BCMA. And by capturing both of them, actually they bring them together. And when they get in contact, this is where you have a killing cascade and your myeloma cell will start being killed. The question, the important question is that if you want your bispecific antibodies to work very well, obviously you need to have enough T cells and a good immune system because they are the soldiers that are going to do the job. And this is why I mentioned uh, in my talk, the, I, the, the issue that at some point we see some what we call T cell exhaustion. That it's like, you know, in any fight, in any battle, if you have an army and soldiers, I mean, if they keep on fighting day and night uh, without any rest, well, they would be exhausted, your soldiers. This is why, now there are uh, studies, but also uh, approaches trying to say, okay, can we stop the treatment of bispecific, with bispecific antibodies after a certain duration of time? In the protocols, not yet, but I think this is uh, uh, the way to go. But also it's easier for the patient and actually we see less infections because obviously, you are hammering less the immune system. So clearly on one hand, you would target and capture the tumor cell. And on the other hand, you capture the T cell and you put them together. And when they get in contact, puff, your myeloma is supposed to uh, start uh, uh, disappearing. Thank you, Professor Marti. I hope this answers well the, the question that was asked on the on the chat. Uh, now I have two questions that are, are related to each other. One about how to decide between um, CAR T cell therapy and by specific treatment, and the other one around sequencing. But uh, maybe uh, we can ask you your personal experience of how you um, go for one versus another with, with your own patients and um, what, what is first advice to um, relapse refractory myeloma patients. Well, how to decide, it's not easy. Well, first of all, if you want to decide, it means you have access to both, which is not always the case because CAR T cells are still uh, difficult to find, I would say. They are concentrated in a few centers and there are very few slots. But I agree. Assuming both of them are available, the issue is that for the CAR T cells, 
it takes several weeks before getting them ready. So you cannot, I cannot see a patient today and say, okay, I'll do CAR T cells tomorrow morning. I can see a patient today, now, tonight, and say, okay, we'll start the bispecific tomorrow morning. So availability and feasibility and how easy is a crucial issue. And remember, in some relapse patient, the disease is extremely aggressive. So you cannot wait for five, six, or seven weeks uh, to get uh, the CAR T cells. So it is a balance about availability, about the kinetics of the disease. But of course, CAR T cells, patient likes them because it's a single shot treatment. By specific, you need to come every week or every other week. So it's a continuous treatment. But on the other hand, they are easily available and even in smaller hospitals. So you don't need to travel to the big academic university hospital, et cetera. Uh, for me, we should not oppose them. That, these are options that are available and whatever is available, I would say, let's take it. Because at the end, if you look to the results, they are quite decent for both. Yes, I think we have several questions uh, that are indeed related to access. Um, um, People in the q and are asking if you know how much th those treatment costs and um, what's the outlook for access to this therapy in Europe today? Uh, well, I don't know the exact cost, but I would say a lot. They are very expensive, but they are bringing value. They are improving the survival and the outcome of these patients. And of course, as a physician, uh, my role is to advocate for availability, accessibility, and affordability for all patients. But I must confess, I'm not the guy who decides on the price. Uh, I've never been asked my opinion about, you know, which price or whatever. But definitely, uh, our hope and our work is to push, to lobby, to make uh, these agents, even uh, if they are supposed to be expensive, uh, to make them available to the majority of patients everywhere because uh, all patients, wherever they are, they deserve uh, to receive the best and most innovative treatments as soon as possible and whenever needed, of course. I see. And do you see um, CAR-T therapies and bispecific therapies coming um, to earlier lines of therapies? Absolutely, absolutely. And this is, for instance, what I... Uh, have shown you with the CAR-T4 trial, mm -hmm. but there are already trials uh, uh, trying even frontline, testing CAR-T cells frontline. Uh, bispecific are being tested even frontline and in early lines of therapy. I think by, for the next 10 years, we will see a significant, a huge change in the treatment algorithm. And I believe the bispecific and CAR T cells will be incorporated in uh, the new algorithm of treatments early in the disease. Because as I said, if you have something that works so well in advanced patient, actually you have to take advantage of it in early patient, in early diseases. So you anticipate longer um, overall response rates and duration of response when therapy is given at early uh, stages or even first line of therapy? Well, at least I hope it will be the case. Mm -hmm. But as you always know, that if we're doing the trials, it means we don't know the answer. Because if we knew the answer, we won't do the trials. We have a speculation that that will be the case but sometimes we've got it wrong. But here, I'm quite optimistic. And you can see the CAR T4 trial clearly could show that by using CAR T cells early, you can do better than your usual standard of care. Also, the standard of care, please don't misunderstand me, is already excellent. But you can be better than excellent. You can be like excellent plus. Mm -hmm. Do you think CAR T will um, replace or even go um, upfront stem cell transplant? Yes, if the trials that are ongoing currently uh, prove to be positive, but 
probably it will take us another five years before we get uh, these answers. And now if I go on the other side of the treatment journey, um, what if patients have exhausted all options? They've already tried one uh, CAR T cell therapy, one bispecific, and then they progress again. What treatment options would be available to them? Are there bispecifics with different targets? Are there CAR Ts with different targets? What's, uh, what's your, what are your thoughts regarding um, refractory patients? Well, I mean, there is no single answer to this. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, the goal is to buy time. If we are able to gain time, there are always new things. You know, every two, three months, I can see new things. There are plenty of trials. For instance, I described to you the bispecific antibodies, but we are already doing trials was tri-specific, you know, with several. I mentioned to you two antigens, BCMA and GPRC5D, but there are other antigens uh, like FCRH5. So for me is that we have a lot of tools. Of course, maybe, I mean, some patient will not live long enough to take advantage of all of them, but we work very hard and we all are optimistic that with time, more and more options will be available. So it's just about buying and being resilient until you know the next line of treatment. Yes, thanks. Maybe but all of could... this comes mm -hmm. with some, of course, we need to acknowledge this because uh, I always like to be balanced and honest with the patient and families that these advances they have a cost for the patient, not in terms of money, but they have a cost in terms of side effects. And this is why we need to learn how to manage the side effects to alert and create awareness about these side effects for the patient. Because the more we know the side effects, the profile of the safety, the better we can handle them. And because I saw some comments from the audience that they have experienced similar side effects to what we describe in the trials, which is true. But then, you know, it's always the balance between the efficacy of the treatment and the side effect. And if your efficacy is higher than your side effect, then we consider it as a treatment that is worth it. Speaking about side effects, um, do you have any sense of what, what the added toxicity, toxicities are over time? One treatment of to another, the long-term toxicities that add up with time? This is a very important question. And this is what I alluded to when I said it has a price. Uh, all of these progresses and advances and modern treatment, they come with a new safety profile. So for instance, yes, there is some additive uh, immunosuppression and the risk of infections can uh, be aggravated over time because the patient are more and more immunosuppressed. Uh, when it comes to the additive risk, we take the basic example, the historical example of peripheral neuropathy related to bortezomib or even thalidomide. Some of the very old patients have received these in the early 2000s. And we know that some patients will keep these side effects for many, many years, and this can be annoying for the quality of life. Uh, when it comes to the additive side effect, for instance, most of these treatments are hitting on the bone marrow because this is where you have the malignant plasma cells. So your bone marrow, especially if the patient got a prior transplant, is becoming a sort of weaker. Your bone marrow reserve because you have like a reserve of bone marrow. And if you keep on hammering it, then you are using your reserve. So yes, they accumulate over time. But again, this is why it is important that we do these trials in a very strict, very stringent manner to really capture all of these side effects. Mm -hmm. I see. I think one of the big hope is that at least with CAR-T, there's the hope for a treatment-free period of time 
um, that you know is um, associated with good quality of life but now we are hearing about you know adding maintenance therapies to it and so on so how do you see that um that setting um in the future are we is it going to be the standard how often people will have to come to the hospital anyway for um any kind of supportive care and uh, maintenance treatment uh, following CAR T or even bispecifics because now they're also talking about fixed duration of bispecifics so yes i i think this is a very important question uh Today, as I mentioned, the beauty of CAR T cells is that it's a single shot treatment and the patient will enjoy some good time, I would say, especially if they responded. Uh, but I agree with you, some of the next trials are testing the use of some maintenance therapy after CAR T cells. And whether we like it or not, actually there is a rational behind this because obviously, if the effect of your CAR T cell was like 100% response and everybody is cured, it's okay. But in order to amplify or to improve the efficacy of your CAR T cells, but also maybe eradicate the residual tumor cells, we may need maybe one, two, or three years of maintenance. For instance, some of the ongoing trials are going up to three years of maintenance. But I agree with you. It would be a bit disappointing because the idea of the CAR T cell is about the single shot, but you need to find again an equilibrium between single shot, but also trying to get rid of the disease. Because at the end of the day, if you are able to get definitely rid of the disease, well, the patient is going to be happy. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that was really helpful. I learned a lot. And maybe I will ask one last question before um, leaving you with the, the last words of the session. We have one question regarding COVID. Um, how COVID is impacting treatment choice um, or, you know, um, the, the, the hospital setting associated with the different treatments and uh, what are their current recommendation? For the patients? Yeah, so, well, obviously, the COVID situation can be different from one place to another, even within the same country. So I can't speak on behalf of uh, every place, every center. Uh, all I can say is, for instance, for us here in France, COVID is not really a matter of concern, and it doesn't interfere with the choice of the treatment or with the way we manage our patients. Obviously, myeloma patient paid a very high price for COVID because they are very vulnerable to the viral uh, coronavirus infection. And we learned more and more how to handle this. But at this stage, I touch wood, you know, I believe things are under control and I encourage the vaccination uh, if it is still available or whatever. But for the time being, I would say, the case is under control. Okay, thank you. Well, that's good news. Well, this is the end of our webinar. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And um, Professor Marty, on behalf of MPE and everyone attending the webinar, thank you so much for being there with us today uh, and to for sharing these highlights from HIHA and for answering all those questions. So maybe you want to share with us one uh, last word um, before we close the webinar. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I always uh, enjoy uh, debating and discussing with the patient. Uh, I always believe they are really uh, the heart of everything we do, and they give us the motivation and the passion to fight. Uh, one key word for the patient and for the families is that we need to be optimistic. Uh, you would hear everywhere that myeloma is an uncurable disease, but actually it doesn't matter. You shouldn't care about this idea of being curable or uncurable. It's about living long, and dwell. And this is a goal that we can achieve these days. And that is the most important. Thank you so much. Thanks for the hope message. And I wish everyone a very nice evening.
Bye, Thank everyone. You. Take care. Bye.